For Krima Media's Polity, I'm Sane Lameni, activist and author Sizwen Bofawash discusses his book titled Democracy and Delusion, 10 Myths in South African Politics. Welcome, Sizwe. Thanks very much, Susanne. Uh, yes. Glad to be finally We're on the side of the camera. We're very honored to have you here today. Thanks. In, in this book, you attempt to expose 10 myths in South African politics. What motivated you to challenge our thinking? Well, I felt that we were having the same conversations over and over again in South Africa about mm. the same things. And part of the reason for that was we weren't challenging our fundamental assumptions. You know, everyone said, oh, we've made a lot of progress, but. Mm. Or people would say, yes, we owe a lot to the ANC, but. Or people would say, free education is a nice idea, but it's just impossible. Mm. And I started to think that the only way we could really have a new conversation is if we started attacking our fundamental assumptions. Have we really made progress? Mm. Is free education so impossible? And so on. Mm. And so the book was really about trying to shake us out of the complacency, which I think we found ourselves in, mm. and trying to spark a new and fresh conversation. Mm. It really shook me, I must say. <laughs> but then yeah. who did you have in mind when you decided to write the book? Well, I particularly wanted disillusioned, disappointed young South Africans who have a lot to offer, but mm. I think who have been forgotten to really use this book as a reference guide for everything that's happening in our country, mm. but also as a weapon to educate themselves on the issues that confront them. Mm. But I'm really glad to see that the book is also being read by people of an older generation. Yes, yes. And uh, there are even some oldies who are now getting down to the album. So, hmm. you know, people are, people are moving. <laughs> I don't know about the rap part, but I'm sure <laughs> I'm my boys you. will be happy. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the myths that you challenge mm. is that of the living conditions. That one really touched me mm. because of mm. my background as well. I grew sure. up in Guamashu. Kay. So, you're saying that they've improved since the dawn of democracy in 1994. What evidence do you present when you support your argument? Yeah, well, the myth that I challenge is that we actually have made a lot of progress on mm. living conditions. Mm. And often you hear, you know, we've got a good story to tell, you know, we're making progress. Mm. But when you really look into it, the first thing I do is say, let's leave the question of service delivery aside for one moment. I come back to it. Mm. But people live inside an economy. And so let's look at what the economy has been doing for the last two decades and unemployment is higher than it was in 1994 as we sit today. Mm. Inequality, the world's worst and growing, worse than 94. Mm. And 55% of people in poverty. So that's the economy in which people live. And mm. when we look at that, you'd have to say we've failed spectacularly. But on the other hand, when you look at questions like electrification mm. or housing or water and sanitation, what you find is that the statistics don't really tell the full picture. So many people may have taps Mm. That doesn't mean that the water runs through them. Mm. Many people might have electricity in their homes. Can they afford it? Mm. So when we really look at what we've been able to so supposedly achieve, we actually have to look more deeply and realize we haven't achieved mm. everything we, we claim to have achieved. And the reason I say that is not to make us feel bad about ourselves. It's to say we can't move forward until we realize how difficult the position we're in is. Mm, yeah. You are also confident that uh, South Africa can tackle the issue of land reform mm. without threatening our stability in the economy. Tell us how is that achievable? That's right. Well, a lot of people say, you know, if we do anything with land, then we'll become Zimbabwe. Exactly. And, oh, no, then, mm. you know, everything will descend into chaos. The first thing I say is, well, things are already chaotic for 55% of the population. The second thing I say is, let's not use Zimbabwe as the scare tactic so that we do nothing and we sit with the greatest inequality in the world. Mm -hmm. Because every country, every important country, from Europe to North America, from Asia to Latin America, has embarked on land reform. And what we've essentially got is a feudal land relation system, mm. which still hasn't been changed since colonialism. And we need to give people access to land. And my argument is that if we do that, that will actually ensure the long-term stability of our country mm. instead of threaten that stability. Mm. Another myth that you explore, do you explore is that South Africans can achieve the issue of racial justice mm. by simply being colorblind and post-racial. Right. How do you foresee that? Well, you know, I think there's been a lot of talk about racism, but it's, m it's mostly about how individuals mm. see racism and mm. racist private beliefs. Mm. And I think we've got too caught up on how individuals see racism instead of seeing that there are structural racisms mm. in our society. 
So the way the economy is structured, the opportunities that people face, the way that access to higher education is, is patterned. Mm. We need to understand that even if everybody tomorrow was a non-racist, South Africa would still be a racist country because we'd have racist relations where people live in certain places de depending on the color of their skin t mm. still to today. Mm. So we really need to look deeper than just a few racist beliefs and actually understand how our society is still founded on racism. And one of the things I think is that apartheid didn't die, it just got privatized. Mm. So instead of being controlled by the state, apartheid then became this decentralized network, which is in, um, it's in schools, it's in universities, it's in uh, the corporate world, mm. and it's even more difficult to defeat when it's so decentralized. And that's the real problem that we have to confront now. Mm. Another myth that's also like, stood out for me sure. was when you exposed that the ANC liberated South Africa. But then are you suggesting that this myth is simply not good enough for us to say maybe the ANC did something for our country? Well, I think you're, you're right to say the ANC did something for us, mm. sure. Um, one would have to concede they did something. The question is, did they do everything? Mm. And all too often, especially in the last few years, this narrative has been painted that we all owe everything to the ANC. Mm. So I think it's important to say, actually, in the ANC's early history, it supported colonialism. And I cite in the book the letters that it wrote to the Queen. It's also important to say that on the question of gender, for example, the ANC has always actually been an agent of oppression, mostly, maybe mm. not in the 90s and 80s. But you know, you look everything from the Kwesi trial and the way that leaders defended the president in that situation, all the mm. way down to the fact that women were only allowed to be full members in 1943, shows you that the ANC has had problems all mm. this time. And it's, it's, again, I don't do this to, to say that the ANC is nothing mm. and that it's, mm. you know, its leaders should all be relegated to the dustbin of history. I do it to say, we shouldn't allow the ANC to blackmail us into thinking that we can't criticize them because we owe our freedom to them. Mm. South African people owe our freedom to ourselves. And if people start using those freedoms against us, we have every right to criticize, mm. no matter whether they liberated us or not. Mm. And in that edition, you also, I was surprised actually mm. that you also criticize Helen Zille mm. and you yeah, went as yeah. far as criticizing, yeah, yeah even yeah. the ANC. But sure, then what sure. are you saying about the EFF? Mm. Well, there actually are places where I do say that the, the EFF, particularly um, Julius Malema, made mm. a mistake, particularly in the Kwesi rape trial where he supported President Zuma, mm. something for which he subsequently apologized and, mm. and has acknowledged. But I think it is important that anyone in political power, whether they're an opposition party or they're the ANC, needs to understand that especially young people are waiting to mm. keep them accountable. Mm. Artists are waiting to keep them accountable. and. It turns out that the ANC is the party in power right now. Mm. But if it was another party, you know, we should all be prepared to hold whatever party happens to hold power to account. And it's really important that we, we don't think that we should shield certain people from accountability mm. while, while we criticize others. So do you have hope for the future of South Africa? I do. Funnily enough, you know, when I wrote the book, when I started, I didn't want it to be a hopeful book. I just wanted to really tell people how bad mm -hmm. Uh, the, the situation was. Mm. But the more I wrote the book, the more I saw solutions are eminently possible. There are a lot of solutions I propose in the book to how mm. we could solve land reform, free education, mm. you know, racism in our society. But there's a lot to be hopeful for. There's a lot to fight for. There's a lot to defend. And mm. that's why I think it's important now to say if we don't defend what has been won, then we stand the chance of being the generation that lost everything that, that was bequeathed mm. to us. So is it safe to say that maybe this book is like a wake-up call to all the South Africans? How would you like South Africans to respond? I think that's a good way to put it. Mm. Um, it's a wake-up call. It's a shock to the system. Mm. It's a way of saying we need to wake up from our complacency. Mm. We need to realize how serious things are. And once we do that, then we can move forward. But mm. if we keep living in this myth that everything's moving forward automatically, we just close our eyes and in five <laughs> years we'll be fine. <laughs> You know, we're not going to get anywhere. Mm. Lastly, we know that you released a companion rap album That's right. with your book. What sort of issues do you deal with in, in this album? The album actually deals with the same issues that are dealt with in the book. Mm. So the book has 10 myths and the album has 10 songs. Mm. Um, there's an introduction and a conclusion which relate to the songs in, 
uh, the chapters in the book. So mm -hmm. there's a song about free education, there's a song about Marikana, mm -hmm. there's a song about race, for example. So mm -hmm. all of the topics that are raised in the book are raised in the album, but from the perspective of an artist as opposed to the perspective of a writer. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to give people two perspectives and the album is really for, for people's hearts, to mm. hit them in the heart, and the book is to hit them in the head. Mm. And would you like, like maybe to give us a few lines of, there was this particular song that resonated with this particular interview, number yeah. eight, Racism oh, yeah. right. Never Died. So right. just a few lines of that, if you don't mind. Oh, sure, sure, yeah. yeah. So um, that one is really about how race affects our society. Mm. Um, and a few lines, for example, I say, whether Kosa or Tswana, this life is no Nirvana. From Marikana to Eric Ghana, racism never died. We stay fresh while they try to take our lives. We consume because pain consumes us from inside. We consume costumes so we can hide. So yeah, it's, it's about kind of being black in South Africa. The mm -hmm. fact that, you know, we think we're moving forward because we can now buy these nice things, but mm. why do we buy these nice things? Is it because we're trying to you know, prevent the pain that we really feel inside? Mm. So the book, again, kind of speaks a bit more to, this is how racism works, this mm. is how it's structured, but the, the album says, this is how I feel mm. as a black South African right now. Mm. When yeah. I told a few people about this interview, yeah. they said, really, what does Sizwe know about being poor? <laughs> what can mm. you say to mm. people like that? Well, look, um, I don't claim to, to know about being poor. I'm mm. not presenting myself as a spokesperson for every South African. Mm. And I think it's important to say that I have had certain advantages in my life. Mm. I tell my story a bit more in the album. It's not quite as simple as a lot of people make out. Mm. You know, having been raised by a single mother and my parents kind of became a lot more economically um, affluent a little bit later in my life. So my childhood was far from affluent. Mm. But at the same time, I have seen certain privileges. I went to St. John's, mm. I made it to Oxford, got a scholarship there. So mm. I'm, I'm cognizant of that. But I think for a lot of black South Africans, young black South Africans who are in that position, we have seen some advancement. We've, we've bitten the fruits of freedom, if you mm. will. Mm. But at the same time, we also are faced with oppression. Just because your parents may have done well doesn't mean you don't face racism. And I think a lot of people think, you know, once you get ahead in life, mm. all of a sudden everything's going to be rosy. And the sad truth of the fact is, when you get ahead, uh, here's another line from the album. Mm. Um, that's what I call a post-apartheid irony. When you get ahead, they take you back to their binaries. Wow. And so while I'm not trying to be a spokesperson for all South Africans, I am trying to say from my perspective, race still matters. I still face racism like all black South Africans every day of my life. Mm. And it's coming to terms with both moving forward and being pulled back that mm. I think is the difficulty in this current moment. Wow. Thank you very much for your time, Sizwe. Thank you. I hope mm. to see you dancing to the album and moving to it soon. I definitely try. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Susanne. That was Sizwe Mbofuwald speaking to Krima Media's Polity about his book titled Democracy and Delusion, 10 Myths in South African Politics.